Oh, okay. So, I think that's the video. Oh, okay. So, I think that's the video. All right, for those of you who don't know Professor Otomi, uh, Professor Otomi is uh, someone who has interestingly been within the national sphere in Nigeria since uh, you know the early 80s. Um, he was born in Kaduna, and uh, even though he hails from Delta State, he had his primary school education at in Kaduna. And then um, he had stints at uh, Lady of Fatima in Guzo in, uh, in the north before going to Christ the King College in Onicha. He ended up his high school at uh, what I would refer to as to the best high school in the whole world known as Loyola College Ibadan. Um, and I say that just because um, that was the high school that I finished from. And we have a very strong presence of old Loyolans here also who have come to uh, welcome, Professor Otomi. And more importantly, Professor Otomi finished high school at the age of 15, back in the days when, um, you know, it takes a long time before people finish high school. So he finished at the age of 15. And um, because the age of entering the university back then is, uh, I think it was around 17. So he couldn't go in straight into the university. He had to go to the Federal School of Arts and Science in the interim before he ended up heading to University of Nigeria in Suka. So Professor Tommy has been a trailblazer in everything that he has been doing. Um, he interestingly was appointed a special advisor to President Shewu Shagari at the tender age of 29. So which is a huge, huge achievement. I mean, compared to now when uh, current political climate is such that before you can get any political post, you are almost in your 60s and 50s and, you know, uh, but with the emergence of Peter Obi, at least encouraging that the youths are being given more um, forefront uh, position in things going on in Nigeria. So at the age of, I think, 29, his you know, late 20s, he was already a special advisor on economic matters to the president, then Shehu Shagari. And he later uh, went to uh, engage in other things. He was a former CEO of uh, the old Volkswagen Nigeria Limited, and he's a professor at uh, Lagos Business School. And uh, for those of us who are members of Opus Dei, he's someone that we look up to because, you know, he's somebody who epitomizes that ideal of, uh, you know, putting your work as a way of uh, reaching out to people and doing the best that you can. So without much ado, I would invite Professor Pat Utomi to our midst uh, to just um, you know talk to us about what is going on with Labour Party and uh, what is going on with uh, Peter Obi. And oh, before I forget, Professor Utomi was actually the leading contender for presidential ticket under the Labour Party, but he was gracious enough to actually join the group of people that went to seek out uh, Peter Obi to bring him into the Labour Party. And he stepped down for Labour Party, which was huge in help. I mean, he stepped down for Peter Obi, which was huge in helping uh, Peter Obi to emerge the Labour Party candidate. And you know, the rest is history, as we've seen that the movement has exploded exponentially. So, Professor Otomi, I would uh, yield to you, sir. Well, thank you so very much. It's such a great pleasure to be able to uh, join in this conversation. A conversation that I think is really um, at the heart of the Nigeria Rescue Project. And I, I say it with every sense of responsibility when I say Nigeria Rescue Project. Um, I don't need to preach to the choir. I think all of you know what the promise of Nigeria uh, held. Uh, you're talking about Loyola College. I still remember that a couple of sets before my set, uh, in the 60s in Lola, I think an entire class except three went to medical school. Uh, and that kind of gives a sense for the kind of um, uh, um, 
commitment to excellence that Nigeria used to be about. Um, in the last 40 years, let me say, because I've been around a little bit. Um, I mean, you, you mentioned how I came to public life. I actually was 27 when President Shagari appointed me uh, into his government. Um, and I knew nobody. I mean, it just pure, pure. I, I, I came back from grad school um, the year before that. And um, I saw some policy tracks going the wrong way. And I began to speak and write about them. Now, when I was in Loyola College, it was during the Civil War, uh, the uh, general manager of NTA, WNTV, sorry, in Ibado, was a man called Vincent Maduka. And uh, a couple of us who were Midwest boys in Loyola, I uh, used to go to the Madukas when we had our exit. Um, and so it was kind of like our, uh, our uh, father during those testy years, 68, 69, you know, and co. And at, it, at this time, he was director general of the NTA when I returned from grad school in 1982. And um, so when he said, saw me, he said, hey, I want you to come and tell us what you have learned, you know, jokingly. And so he put me on, just put me on TV. And, of, you know, uh, people were probably finding some value in what I was saying. And um, one day the vice president turned to some of his friends and said, I'd like to, you know, meet this guy or something. I said, I know we can fetch him. And they fetched me, as it were. And I had been talking about tax policy majorly around that time, how the fact that accountability was challenged because people didn't pay taxes and governments didn't seem to care enough about the people connecting back issues of equity and taxation and blah, blah, blah. So uh, I was invited over for a chat with him and we had this conversation and he asked if I could do him some position papers on the matter. And I said, oh, why not? I'll cut the frills around the story because if the story is a little well known. But two weeks after he got the papers, he invited me to uh, his home on a Saturday evening. And I um, was just making conversation. And just in the middle of it, just he quietly hinted that um, Professor, that uh, the President Shagari had just approved that I replace Professor Denigwe. And I was completely taken by surprise. Why, why do I find this story uh, useful to tell today? It's almost impossible that this kind of thing will happen today. Uh, because today government is not seen about giving value, what you bring to the table. It's seen uh, as um, compensation for some game is seen as part of a series of transactions. You help me to rig, I appoint you to a position. Um, part of what it has done is brought some of the less than competent people in our country to the uh, corridors of, of power and the effects can be seen all, our, all over us, the decay that our country is experiencing everywhere it's i mean if you sit with leaders of government in our country not only will you weep but you you want to mourn because first of all most of them are not even interested all that therefore is what transaction can get them something and how they can, they can throw their weight around uh, the prestige of power and all of that and you know that a society cannot be sustained like that, and the evidence is all over us. So um, as I've watched this decay through the years, I've said to myself, what, what is it that is possible that can be done to turn things around? I analyzed, I, oh, I struggled to analyze these things to understand why we were 
traveling this path, which I referred to many, many years ago already as the road to Somalia. Uh, in fact, at the point in time, I referred to the, the road to Kinshasa, you know, when um, Congo was going through all kinds of towns more than 20 years ago. And then we began to look like we were heading towards Somalia. Um, and for me, I could analyze it using a simple template that comes from structural economics. You know, it's called the structure conduct performance paradigm. The structure of an industry, you know, would dictate the kind of conduct that takes place if there's intense rivalry, if it's a, an industry where you are a monopoly, you act differently. If it's where there's intense rivalry, you know, you act in a particular way and performance outcomes can be seen flowing from the nature of how you behave, the culture in that kind of industry that's been affected by uh, the structure. It seemed to me clearly that the nature of the transactions that are forced on players by the structure of these parties just made it impossible for even even good people when they enter. I mean, I just left a, a meeting at which Dele Farutimi was present. Now, uh, Dele keeps making the point in many of his brilliant television appearances that even if you got a genius into office in Nigeria, he would have a great deal of trouble doing things well. And because of the nature of the structure of the federation. But it's even worse that we're not getting geniuses in there. We're getting the pretty much close to the exact opposite of geniuses. So it was even compounding things much further. So how do you break this vicious cycle that is spiraling downwards? I thought we have to abandon these parties with their nature, with their structure and the nature of behavior that comes from that structure. We have to create a new political party, an alternative political party. There was one problem, you know, with um, the so-called alternative parties. Uh, the big ones often accuse them of um, not having structure. And what in the world is structure? Well, structure is being able to have a network of people who more or less help you abort the will of the people, very frankly. Uh, structure is having enough people on ground with your party offices and enough people to be there at the polling station. So when you're a person isn't there, as it will happen to most small parties, the PDP and APC guys will just agree what votes to allocate to you, even if you've got all the votes, and they will write what they like for themselves. So I, I began to think, how do we uh, break out of this perception that, you know, there's no point in voting for a person who is running under a party other than any of these two because, quote unquote, they will not win because they don't have structure. And I began to look at organizations that were broadly present, Nigeria writ large. And uh, it was clear to me that the kinds of structures, if you will, that exist were either in faith organizations like the church or in the labor movement, for example where the NLC has 36 commissions, political commissions as they call them, in all the states of the Federation, and therefore are close enough to every polling station that if they deployed appropriately, they could stop this rigging, but more than even stopping it, mm -hmm. give enough confidence to people to vote for a candidate not running under APC or PDP. So I began to explore in meetings with labor unions, 
how this could be done. I wasn't certain that we'll get success, but I kept working at it. A little over two years ago, I met the working National Working Committee of the Nigeria Labor Congress. And they seemed quite enthusiastic. And we continued to meet. Cut a very long story short. Um, Labor Party had been alienated from the labor unions. Uh, that gives another long story. So when we started our conversations, the idea was to adopt another party that seemed fairly better organized, like the ADC or the SDP, or better still, a fusion of all of them. So a series of meetings started in the office of the NLC president, Ayuba Waba, and we had the SDP, we had the ADC, um, and a couple of others. We had agreed literally in principle to use the ADC as base uh, on the understanding labor leaders suggested that um, by the way, it was important for them to convince their members that ADC had to change its logo or something to reflect workers or change its name to AD Labor's Workers Party. Long story again that I'll cut through. Um, after we had more or less uh, begun to focus on this. Um, some people from the ADC thought, why should we change our name? We can be used. And Femi Falano, who was part of our conversations, had actually said from onset that he could retrieve the Labour Party, which was actually registered with Labour Union money. He went to court and managed to obtain judgments that made that seem probable. And so suddenly, the Labour Party was in the picture, very, very close to um, the time for primaries to all go, go up. And that's how we ended up with the Labour Party. And I was feeling quite uh, good that we could project and show structure. And then Peter would be suddenly saw that there was no way he could get anywhere in the PDP and decided to opt out in one, two quick conversations. I, I mean, said and did something that I have done in several iterations, more or less, in, in, in Nigerian politics, uh, uh, which is, uh, it's not about me. It's about what can make the country work. Uh, Peter was beginning to gain some kind of traction with the messages he was sending out uh, uh, to young people. And I thought, hey, if we all collaborated and worked together, uh, for me, one of my big things is uh, that leadership is not about title, it's about affecting things. In fact, I set up a center for values in leadership and one of our big mantras drawn from the Canadian called Robbie Sharma is a leader who had to. If we work together and Peter get elected president, my, my goal would have been achieved. Once I yielded to Peter, and the whole thing just seemed to catch the imagination of people, and this thing took off like a rocket. And, and so uh, we are here working at the possibilities that for the first time uh, in our, I guess, um, a, a democratic history post 1998, we have a pretty good shot for winning the presidency uh, from outside of these two parties, rescuing Nigeria. Uh, rescuing Nigeria, uh, not because uh, uh, Peter Obi is a genius, but because he's an available instrument that all of us can work through to ensure that we have a government that really serves the interest of the people. And we are developing a series 
of ways of ensuring that that can happen. And one simple example uh, I want to share uh, with you now is that um, oftentimes in governing Nigeria, there is a tendency to assume that those who are in power know what to do and that the people, the constituents are just a bunch of morons that you help solve their problems. And this is really genuine ignorance, uh, not out of wickedness. And there's a classic example that I have tried to get people to assimilate you know, in the last three years, I mean, one of the terrible things about the Buhari presidency, which in my view, and I was a big supporter of General you know, Buhari at some points in his quest for uh, power. Uh, but what has become so clear and so uh, evident is the myopia in dealing with some national issues like the headsman crisis. Uh, now, a uh, friend of mine, uh, Dr. Tanimu Yakubu, who was chief economic advisor to uh, President Yaradua, said something I found remarkable and really spurred new thinking uh, for me. Um, Tanimu Yakubu, before he became chief economic advisor to President Yaradua, had served as his um, commissioner of agriculture when Eradua was governor of Katsina State. He said that when they got to office, the single biggest challenge they saw was that fertilizer purchase sucked up most of Katsina's budget. Everything was about fertilizer. And they look at yields, look at all kinds of things, and they didn't see any commensurate impacts of the resources that were flowing into fertilizer. And so um, at a point in time, they had to call in uh, one of the consulting firms, I think KPMG or one of those. Oh, tell us what is going on. We spend so much money on fertilizer, we're not seeing its impact on agriculture, and the whole budget process was about fertilizer. So a simple study uh, was commissioned to find out from the farmers why fertilizer was not you know, resulting in the kind of output they expected. And um, they had a list of 20 um, things that they wanted for, um, uh, um, farmers to uh, essentially rank in terms of their importance to business of cultivation of uh, uh, whatever. And then um, to their shock, they found that in the order of importance, farmers ranked fertilizer 13th out of 20. 13th, how can it be? All their budget is going to something, the farmers rank 13th. So they said to them, yeah, okay, what you have ranked as your biggest challenge here is desert encroachment. What is responsible for this desert encroachment so that we can stop it and improve your yield? And the farmer's response, open grazing, open grazing. 20 years before Buhari came to the presidency of Nigeria, his home state, Katsina, had found that the biggest problem to their development was open grazing. And here, this president was passionately insisting that the whole of Nigeria should be opened up to open grazing. Now, you can take it from a political angle and say, what the heck? But the naked truth was the enormous uh, negative power of ignorance because you think you know but don't know. And I think that you can take it across the board in Nigeria. One of the biggest challenges is that we govern top down but we need to govern bottom up. 
if we're going to make change happen. In my own business of teaching management, that kind of change is called emergent change, bottom-up change. Say as different from the culture change uh, uh, approach, programmatic change, uh, uh, or structural, you know, disruption. Now, um, so one of the things that I, we are hoping to do with this campaign is to listen and to listen to the Nigerian people about what they need changed, what the problems they perceive are, and what they think should be done to solve those problems. So we intend to begin uh, what I call um, listening, listening clinics. So when I got a call from Dr. Kocha about your group, which I, I, I thought was fantastic and fascinating, one of the things that struck me was that we could, in fact, have a town hall meeting with doctors um, that would be, um, you know, virtual and physical. Uh, and the issue would be what needs to be done to save the healthcare system in Nigeria? Because also a, a subject that I'm fascinated by, uh, one of the things that I do from out of the Center for Values in Leadership is run a series called the Nigeria History Series to look at what went wrong with policy in Nigeria. Why did we get this wrong? Why did we get that wrong? So we take a sector of the Nigerian economy. We did it for... Uh, most of the, we started during the COVID period, it was a Zoom meeting. Uh, we have one on the 21st, Sunday 21st, uh, looking at infrastructure. Uh, so we've taken different sectors. Last, in the heat of, of the COVID uh, pandemic, we did the healthcare sector. In fact, we got as many as seven former ministers of health on those conversations. They were, really fascinating conversations. Uh, 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 Professor Itayo Lambo, who's spending more of his time in Atlanta, uh, uh, participated on two or three of those episodes. Uh, I, I enjoyed that because at first he said, look, look, Pat, I'm, 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 I'm tired, I'm fed up. I don't want to talk about Nigeria. Look, leave me alone. And then he participated. He, said, he called back and said, hey, that was good. I'd like to do it again. So they participated in the second round and the third round. Um, we, we, we found in that series, for example, around healthcare, that every minister of health, and I got Mamora, who was incumbent at that time, uh, to participate also. Every minister of health is, you know, former minister of health was frustrated with the fact that they couldn't really implement everything they wanted to do or that the things they even suggested were dumped the day before the day after they left office and so on and so forth and, and where i'm coming from if there are only two things that government must do if they want progress in any country in the world it's education and health care if People are educated and they are well, they would make any other thing happen. Uh, in fact, in, in my work, I very frequently turn to the, the work of a Princeton economist who won the 2015 Nobel Prize, Angus Deaton, mm -hmm. uh, and his book, um, The Great Escape, Health, Wealth, and the Origins of Inequality. I mean, if you look at societies around the world, the ones that have better health care are usually the ones that are more successful. And, and so health has to be on a foundational issue to be dealt with, with any society that really does want to make progress. And I thought that a town hall meeting with a group like this would be fantastic to try and put this on the front burner and consciousness of the whole country. Um, I, I think that too often we don't get things in the right direction because those who are affected by policy 
don't speak up enough around policy. Um, mm -hmm. Sometimes they organize and aggressively go after, like say the way the NMA used to uh, uh, do many, many years ago and all this. But there's no way that things are going to get right unless the people who are involved, who are the base constituents, uh, do not engage, even if they disagree in how, uh, with one another, on what should be done. And ultimately, boundaries will be built up and functioning within those boundaries. That's what institutions are. And really, in my opinion, uh, institutions and culture are fundamental. Professor Tommy, since your group, and looking to um, working with with you in many ways uh, to promote this change in Nigeria, and to um, you know uh, come to a, a, a point where we can get a candidate that knows that he must listen into um, office and begin to change our country for good. So it's not just about, uh, it's not about P2B, it's about a movement to turn Nigeria around. And, um, you know, I'm, you know, truly, truly thrilled that, you know, we can be together on this project. So maybe I'll just stop there in my general remarks and I can take uh, responses. By the way, as I see that some of, some of you are calling from, uh, yeah, have tuned in from around the world. Uh, Peter B and I will probably be in a few cities in the US beginning later this month. Very, very short visits. I don't think we spend more than 12 hours or 18 in any particular city except Washington, DC. But, but when Los Angeles on the 29th, when Houston on the 30th, we're in, um, in uh, Charlotte, where a group of Nigerian doctors are actually coordinating the visit. I was on, the, on a Zoom call with them till late yesterday night, Nigerian time. Uh, Dr. Ben Okwara uh, in Charlotte and, and some. And then we are in Atlanta, you know, with the, with the, we're in Washington, D.C. on the 1st of September. We're um, in um, Atlanta on the 3rd, I think. Then we're in New York on the 4th. And, and uh, Chicago, I think, on the 5th or 6th. Right. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Tommy. And uh, you guys have heard it from the horse's mouth. Um, for anyone who has been privy to watching Patito's gang back in the days where Professor Tommy used to gather Ruben Abati and a bunch of other people to kind of dissect uh, things going on in Nigeria, you will understand where I'm coming from, that he's a very, very cerebral person who is able to dissect issues. And just to summarize what he has said, which I think is key for us as we all work together in this movement and in this project that leadership is not about me, but what we can do. And I think that is huge for each and every one of us to take home as we continue on this path to try to rescue Nigeria. And then things which I was so mind blowing for me is you know, what we have kept talking about that rescuing Nigeria is not about Peter Obi, is not because Peter Obi is a genius, but he's an available instrument that we can use to make sure that government works for everybody. And then um, it is erroneous to assume that those who are in power know what to do, that it is us, the constituents, the citizens that have to take the bull by the horn to make the changes. And this movement which we have of doctors and uh, allied health workers you know, signifies that because People have donated their time, money to actually help with this campaign, which is unprecedented. It's never happened, to the best of my knowledge, in Nigerian election where ordinary citizens are actually, you know, helping. And we need to make sure that down the road we institutionalize that in our country that government is from people going up and not this top-down approach that has failed us. And more importantly, since we are all in the healthcare sector, that we can be 
advocates of change by liaison with him and the members of the Peter Obi um, group if when he gets into government. And then most importantly that, you know, every successful nation needs to have good health care. Now, um, I will call some people. I see a lot of hands here. Um, I would say, Dr. Kocha, can you unmute, can you unmute yourself? You're still muted, actually. Dr. Kocha, you're muted. You, you are doing muting me now. Okay. Okay, I'm oh. on. Okay. Prof, good evening, sir. I want to good thank evening. you very much for coming. Yes. Um, uh, we, we, in this uh, uh, movement, we are ready to collaborate with the uh, Labour Party in any way you feel is necessary. And I believe I speak for everybody. One of the questions I wanted to ask you, which I think you have touched uh, to a certain extent, is that issue of good governance, where, who holds the most responsibility to, ash, to make sure it happens? Is it the leaders themselves or the people? Thank you. Thank you. It's really uh, uh, both. Um, first and foremost, if political parties were well organized in Nigeria, if we had political parties, because my argument, my thesis, is that we don't have political parties in Nigeria. In fact, it used to be uh, 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 a bit of a paradox. How did the APC come about? Uh, a newspaper called Leadership Newspaper ha has this annual lecture that was quite famous. And I was the speaker for 2012. And the subject they asked me to speak on was political parties and political opposition in Nigeria. Um, it's one of my favorite papers. I've written hundreds, if not thousands of speeches in my time, but I thoroughly enjoyed that lecture. <laughs> if, I, if I might say so, I had fun giving it. But part of what fascinated me was the effect. Now on the high table on that day, where Bola Ahmed, Tinubu, Muhammad Buhari, uh, Konde, just most of the opposition leaders of note. And as I finished giving that lecture, Dr. Paul Unongo, Paul Unongo, the famous uh, Benue politician from back in the Shagari era, Paul Unongo ran up to the podium from which I was speaking and said, I wish I could lock the door of this Ladikwali Hall, where it was at the Sheraton, and prevent all these men from leaving until all of you tell us how we can get the PDP out of power. For all intents and purposes, that was what eventually happened. He didn't lock the door. But conversations that started from there led to the founding of the APC. Unfortunately, the APC did not manage to become a political party. It just proved to be a machine that people who were looking to take power latched onto to get rid of the external order. And the fact that APC never became a political party uh, was severely damaging for the performance of that party. I, I can tell you that I, when all was done, my friend, uh, Chief John Odigio Oyegun emerged chairman of the party. And I said to him, look, um, we need to organize this party such that nobody can even contest uh, on the platform of this party without getting some thorough grooming on what the party stands for, some basic issues around the economics of how the country should travel from perspective of the party, some basic issues on values, our ethics and ethos. And um, um, well, uh, Chibo Yugo said, ah, there's no money to run all these lectures you are talking about. I said to him, look, you don't need any money. 
In fact, let me volunteer now. I will bring my friends, the Bismarck Rwandais, the Doing Salamis. I'll bring them all free of charge. They will come because I've asked them. All you should do, and you have these big rooms in this party headquarters, very big, long, open rooms. Just ask all the candidates to come here. On their own, they will fund it, come there. And we will train them, socialize them into where the country should be looking. <laughs> it never happened. That was my first signal that there was no real seriousness to create a political party as part of the kind of lecture that I gave that started that whole talk. Um, so the leaders have a critical role to play because uh, they have to have systems that hold people accountable, uh, consequence management, all of those things need to be in place at the top. But the people also matter a great deal. There's a very important role for civil society in affecting the direction and conduct of um, leaders. The citizens also, if people knew for sure that if they messed up in public office, not only would they not be re-elected, but they will be shown in society. Media will make, make them, you know, pariahs almost. They would not behave the way they behave in office. But because there seems to be no consequence in, in Nigeria, and people just get there and do whatever they, they, they like. The, um, okay, I'll give it a, a small example. When President Yaradua was elected in a complete non-election, I mean, he accepted that, admitted it publicly. The worst possible election in Nigeria, and I, I was a candidate for president that year, it was out of 2007. I mean, General Basanjo was so, so determined that Atiku would not succeed him that he ensured that there was no election. I remember having lunch after those elections with uh, the now late Madeleine Albright, former US Secretary of State, and the former Nigerian uh, Canadian Prime Minister, um, John, um, what's his name, man? Anyway, and they, they were in shock. They had never seen anything like that before in their lives. I couldn't believe a country could call those elections. But anyway, uh, that happened. And President Obasanjo uh, shooed in uh, 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 President Yaradua, who was not well, was not even in the country most of the campaign. Um, but President Yaradua wanted change. He wanted to you know, stop these ways of doing things. Uh, he invited me to Abuja to meet with him. Uh, it was a very interesting Friday evening. I mean, uh, again, I've told this story a few times. A Friday morning, uh, he was meeting with his uh, economic team. Uh, so, AZ of due process was coming out. My friend, um, uh, 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 former student, if you will, uh, Remy Babalola, who was in finance at the time. And a few of the other ministers, you know, Yeradua came out with them and came to see me and said, look, conversation I'd like to have with you is so important. I don't think we should have it in the office. Uh, let me shut down for the day, do my Friday prayer, and let's go to the house and talk. So we went to the residence. I, uh, <laughs> and President Yeradua, dismissed everybody and stepped into a room with me and said, uh, Professor, what is wrong with Nigeria? I said to him, you can't ask somebody like me that question because I'll give you a four hour lecture without stop. Are you, are you sure you'll survive it? Uh, he said, trust me, I will survive it. And I began to talk. Anyway, cut again, long story short. Uh, when I finished, he said, you see, that's why people say few people understand Nigeria with the death that you do. And you refuse to come into government. Why don't you come in? Let's work together to change this place. Then I told him the story of recruitment into power in Africa. In political science, there's a, 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 a um, 
concepts is referred to as uh, the corporatist state in post-colonial Africa. Uh, in that uh, view of uh, recruitment into public life, it is said that the state in post-colonial Africa often seeks to incorporate people who have voices of dissent and then to compromise them, if you will, and um, their value in society is then lost. So I told him that I could not join his government because my fear is that it is the corporatist arrangement that if you bring in this strong voice of dissent, you will then compromise that person with everybody around him stealing as much as they like, and then you are all bunched together. And he said to me, no, 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 no. You know, um, it, it has to be different. I said, how will it be different? Uh, and I said to him, okay, look, I'm a patriot. Uh, I can agree to give you counsel anytime. You can call me at 2 a.m., 3 a.m., ask my opinion on anything, you will get it. But I'm not sure I'm going to jump into government with the kind of things that I know go on and expect that I will not then be tired by the same brush. Uh, he said, look, there is no way you are going to have impact being outside of government. You, you know, whatever little you can do there, you can do 100 times more if you're in government. And, um, and I said to him, you know, if, if I, let me give you one piece of advice, get seven or, or so good people, give them the core of government, and you can appoint, appoint to all those your transaction people to ministries where they share money, transport, all those kind of places. But at the core of what determines how the country is traveling, you have seven people you know you can rely on who don't care about the size of their bank account, you know, but they know that from the work they do, they could attain immortality. People could remember them forever. Uh, he, he said to me, look, uh, why do I have to, okay. Uh, 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 why do you ask me, why don't you give me seven good people and become the eight persons and you come into government and I give you full assurance. You run the most important places that show direction to the country. And um, so he was very persuasive. Like I, I tell you, we talked for more than three hours. He was very, very persuasive. Uh, in many ways, I think it's a shame that he died because I think he could have been a transforming leader in spite of how he got there. Um, so, you know, I just said to him, look, okay, let me go and think about seven good people and send you their names. And that's the story of government in Nigeria. I did come up with the names of seven people and I handed it to the head of service to give to him. And that was the last I ever had from Miradua. So I figured, okay, he didn't like one or two names there because I had a name like El Rufai. Uh, you know, my, my explanation is simple. Uh, you, you can think what he like of El Rufai, you know, but if you want to get some certain kinds of things done, you know, El Rufai will kill his brother to get it done. So you need somebody like him sometimes. Uh, you know his nature, his limitations. But he's the kind of guy who can do certain kinds of things, and I thought he was useful. I, I knew the two of them didn't get along well, so I thought maybe that was why. Of course, shortly after he died, um, we didn't get to see again. Only years later, to be told by a very, very senior person uh, in, the, in the North, a big traditional ruler, that Yeradua thought I snubbed him and went to his grave thinking that. I said, what do you mean? I sent him this list he asked me for. He said to me, the list never reached him. So, so you see all these games get played that eventually um, shortchange the Nigerian people. Uh, and, and so you have to have strong civil society 
the people have to be able to throw out at the next election somebody who hasn't performed in their interest the way they see it. But the process just prevents that from happening. I mean, I can tell you that every election we've had in Nigeria has been rigged. Every significantly rigged. I mean, if it's small rigging, okay. Um, but very significantly. I might be going out on the limb, but I think Atiku Abubakar defeated Buhari in the last election. And you can go back, 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 back. Uh, people have to do something to prevent people from easily uh, thwarting the will of the people. And that's what's been happening. People must organize. And there are examples of where they've succeeded. Kano is an example I can give you. We are an incumbent governor, Kwan at the time, kind of treated the civil servant badly. And young people went to the civil servant and asked him to run against him. And the civil servant said, my friend, me, where do I have the money to run against the governor? And I put pressure on him. Eventually he agreed. The youth went out and protected the votes at every level. And he beat the incumbent governor by 400,000 votes. A gentleman is Ibrahim Shekarao. So, these things are possible, but we just don't try. Again, um, I, I skipped an example. I, when I was talking with Yerad, I was going to mention for your benefit as doctors, one of you, Dr. Emmanuel Nsang, was a strong leader of the Nigerian Medical Association. And in the corporate state tradition, he was appointed Minister of Health. All of us know how the government used Madison Sang to deal a harsh blow to the enemy. And as you can see, doctors are still bitter with him today. I mean, I, as pro chancellor of one university, I was talking to the provost of the College of Medicine, and he was so still, I mean, I'm talking about 25 years on, he was still so angry with Emmanuel Sang. And as we all know, he's never recovered. Uh, in terms of uh, political standing or whatever. Um, that's how these games have been played. And, you know, uh, uh, reduce the possibilities of progress in our country. But we can reverse these things. We can change them. That is why the moment excites me. I have never been as excited in these 40 years of struggle as I have today. I was telling a group... Uh, Next year will be 50 years since I, as a young student leader, began struggling at the University of Nigeria with the Adikbiju Memorial uh, uh, demonstrations that led to the closure of universities across the country. And um, in all these 50 years, I have never felt as I feel now in my bones that we can change Nigeria and stop the slide. Long answer. I'll try to make the others much, much shorter. <coughs> Thank you very much, Prof. Um, I will call Dr. Cordelia Udo because Dr. Udo has asked a very pertinent question about you know, what we can do for Labour Party. Dr. Udo, are you still here? If you want to ask your questions quickly. Um. Sorry, I won't show my face. <laughs> yes, yeah, so I, I'm just uh, so amazed after listening to our prof here. These are the kind of uh, caliber leaders, and that's what led to Peter be taking over. He stepped down. Um, my question is, uh, I know you people are saying they are the structures. But at some point, we need to know where no. are the Labour Party headquarters in the local government, all the local government areas. You know, it's, um, it would be nice to, for people to see that sign, to see that building, to give them that assurance that indeed the Labour Party has come of age. Um, and it's something that I just learned here that you guys are visiting US, um, but I was thinking people here by approaching them can actually volunteer to erect or lease for a specified period of time. 
uh, buildings within each local government area to furnish and equip that for Labour Party. And so how many headquarters do Labour Party have in Nigeria? And what are your needs? Do you think you actually need headquarters in, in every local government area? Is, is it something? Uh, matter in this election because maybe it doesn't matter. And uh, secondly, hey, people are coming to my husband and I. If we can uh, uh, um, organize fundraising for Peter V, and I've I've always been directing them to all these links. Uh, but I just learned that Peter V and Co will be coming down. Uh, my house, uh, just my sunroom alone can contain 100 people. <laughs> so, uh, but I'll keep that, um, uh, I will, uh, we'll talk about that. Okay. Well, thank you. I, I think, uh, so the important thing to me, it's, I'm done. Oh, okay. Okay, right. lovely. Okay, very quick uh, I want Thank you so uh, uh, very much. Uh, first of all, there are Labour Party offices, not as many as PDP offices, but they exist. Uh, just about every state capital does have one. There's a website for the Labour Party and it will list this. It's been fascinating how people have been donating their homes some for the period from now through the elections, some for longer. Uh, I, I, have, I mean, I've not seen this in a long time uh, uh, in our clients. Uh, uh, a friend of mine who used to be chief executive of uh, an airline says, look, I have this huge house in, in Uyo. I think we're part of Uyo, I call the GRA. And says, we'll take it and do whatever you, you know, I'll paint it. To the, Labour Party uh, colors and all of that, and that's fine. And there are many more going to be opened in the next week or two. But the truth of the matter is that we're talking disrupt. Uh, strategies of disruption do not follow convention. They don't follow orthodoxy. Um, in fact, you need to be so different from the orthodox to be able to uh, uh, break the orthodox. And really truly, uh, what we need and what we have uh, quite a bit of already uh, being set up are technologies. There is a group in Canada of diaspora people who we've agreed with, they're gonna build us this mobile app that can enable us be in touch with every polling agent in the country and monitor real time what's going on across the board. There can't be better structure. Those offices don't get to pull out the kind of activity that that kind of app can help us uh, hit. We have at least three or four. Now, one of the good fortunes of being a business teacher like I have been is that perhaps a significant percentage of the CEOs in the country today are former students of mine. And a group of them got together and came to me a couple of weeks ago, uh, the ones that are in the tech space, and they want to build us a great platform to do a number of these things from out of including for fundraising, for just the whole shebang, as they say. And they're donating this. It's not costing us anything. So we've got that uh, going, but clearly we still need to um, raise a lot of funds to keep the machinery running. On election day, if we don't have a significant number of people in every polling booth, uh, we could be squandering, if you put it that way, uh, the goodwill that we have managed to see generated. 
the way this system runs, unfortunately, uh, many of those polling agents will have to be given some stipend. And given the number of those polling booths, we might need like one point something million people, uh, you know, and you may need to pay each person at least 10,000 naira or whatever. So those are significant amounts of money. Of course, while some of these websites and um, platforms are being uh, given as gifts to the campaign, uh, there are some that require some funding, like the Canadians building this, you know, I mean, from amongst the group like this, you can uh, just agree and we will send you the invoice, you deal with the, 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 the developers directly and pay them. You know, those kinds of things will help enormously. Right. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Tommy. So uh, just to paraphrase, I, I'm sure what Dr. Cordelia, two things she wanted to know is our group would like to host a fundraiser and she has volunteered that she can actually host Peter Obey in her house and we can leverage our members to say we can come there if you guys are open to the idea and then get more people to come and do a fundraiser. That's one. And then the other thing is this uh, local government uh, headquarters and local government presence of Labour Party. How can we help? And just to piggyback to what you have said, if we know the number of polling units in the nation and we say we need to have polling agents, how many do we need to have? And if we say maybe 10,000 Naira per head, is it possible for Labour Party to send like a document to us? I'm pretty sure there are some of our members who might be willing to actually pull money towards that as we move forward towards the election. Okay. So, uh, Mr. Dr. Uzoku, are you here? Dr. Uzoku is the national coordinator of uh, um, doctors and medics for Peter Obi. If he wants to ask his questions. Okay. Uh, good evening, uh, Prof. Good evening, Dr. Ferdinand. Um, Prof, you're welcome to the Health Workers Platform that has been doing a lot, carrying out outreaches. Uh, Thank you. Yes. Now, I want to ask a question. One of the challenges we encountered while carrying out our outreaches across 23 states of the uh, country is we find out that um, within the South, Peter Obi is well known and accepted. But within the North, the core North, you find out a situation where, yes, they are tired. Yes, they are not comfortable with the current government. But you still see that uh, leniency to the their uh, um, APC and the PDP federalism. So how can the Labour Party help in convincing and getting these people to choose Labour? Because it's more like the South already. We we've been waiting for this all this while, but the North will still have a lot to do in trying to convince them that look, the APC and the uh, PDP, they have not been giving you what you want. They know it within their self, but trying to pull them away from their allergies and babas, they already know. How would the Labour Party help us in going forward with that? Yeah, well, thank you. Um, I think that um, it is not untrue that, um, the penetration in the north because of consumption of social media differences may not be as deep at this time, but it's growing. Um, and, and that's where most of the work that we have to do will go. In the north, people have, radio is a very powerful medium. Uh, most people get their information from radio and remarkably sometimes foreign radio like the BBC House of Service. And some of those uh, uh, um, kinds of stations. But um, I think that our strategy is to use more of those to penetrate. But there is something that we often miss
Professor Tommy, are you still there? Professor Tommy? I was we know the war combined. Um sometimes they are underreported. Sometimes even the reported ones. Prof, we're not hearing you. Right. I think I think we um internet stuff. Um that's Nigeria now went came. So the uh, the, the local um, internet, uh, I think, uh, bleeped. Okay. Um, anyway, so um, the more disenchantment can be easily mobilized in the north. And, and we are going to speak to many of the issues, but we are being very careful. Look, the impression has always been given that we have a monolith north, which is not true at all. What is going on in Zamfara state is a civil war between the Hausas and the Fulanese. The deep divisions in the North that has been papered over through the years about, oh, these Northerners, they're all Hausa, Muslims, not true. The nepotism of the Buhari government, you know, sharpened the cleavages and has literally resulted in a major civil war that's going on improperly reported in Northern Nigeria. We are careful not to stook that in an easy way to penetrate the North. We want to make sure that we can unite Nigeria, Hausa, Fulani, Igbo, Yoruba, Epic, um, Angaz, whoever, you know, in, in this process. But we'll still be able to communicate the failure of governance in a way that we think will be eventually heard. They will try to play the old game. Ah, they're making this a Christian thing. Ah, they're making this a, oh, uh, 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 an Igbo thing. The Igbos who try to secede, I pop. Well, and I can say this here, as General Basonjo who attended one of our meetings, in fact, called the meeting of the OB campaign to address us, said to us, said, look, every part of Nigeria has tried to secede from Nigeria. So that's what the big deal is, the expression of their frustration. And the very first to actually try to secede was Northern Nigeria. So nobody should be faced with this, or oh, this will try to secede business or IPOB and all of that. Uh, I still want to make sure that the strategy we use does not further tear the North apart because the North is really ripped apart. And it's even worse when you look at the fact that more than Nigerians actually realize a significant part of the North is made up of Christian minorities. And they are the most angry and most virulent in the way they want. Uh, uh, we don't want this campaign to be part of uh, widening that chasm that exists in parts of northern Nigeria. But we'll get our message across eventually. We're working on it. All right. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Prof. So um, uh, just uh, to say something, because I know there is a lot of questions that I'm saying here. Um, from what I'm gathering, that the number of polling units in the whole uh, uh, Federation of Nigeria is 176,974. So, Prof, I'm sure you're taking note. If you can help us reach out to Labour Party, how they want to fund the people that will go to monitor votes for them on that day and how they want to apportion it, if they can bring out a figure and number I am pretty sure there are individuals that will be willing to pay for either local government or for some right. words and that, but they need to be able to tell us and say, this is how much we need for these specific places. And 
this is where you can make this payment to. I'm pretty sure there are people who will be willing to do that. So I'll call Dr. Mujeje to ask his questions. Okay. Hello. Um, thank you, uh, Professor Otomi, for uh, making our time to spend with us today. And I believe that the education and the, the, what we've learned in terms of having a deep dive of the political side of things is very, very helpful. But um, I, I just have to reiterate what we have said here about the momentum and the force that we have, uh, P2B's coming into the election has brought to the fore and the need for us to really um, maintain this tempo in converting what the followership and the things that have been generated so far into a success. So the question I have, I have just two major questions and this, uh, this is a, a, a tandem with the efforts of the party because what I noticed with the, what's happened so far is that the party is ha actually having a very good problem because if you have a problem where you have more people asking for help than you know, you know, what the party can do, I think is a very, very good, uh, good problem. So the question I have is, you know, you being an insider and knowing what's going on with the party, we have a lot of volunteers. We have a lot of people that are really interested in, in a new Nigeria, in a better Nigeria. And they're really just not making it just a social media thing like we talk about. They're wanting to commit time, commit finances and efforts to make sure that these things are done. The question I have is that, do we have a way of improving the communication with the party? Because if you look at what we've been asking, it seems there's a little bit of a less clarity about what actually the party needs. We have, you know, we are, we are volunteering ourselves to do a lot of work for the party, but what do they actually need in terms of, okay, this is the areas that we are having difficulties. This is the area that we are having difficulty. Because if you remember, we are fighting against a very formidable team. The PDP and APC, they've done this. They've been in power for so long. So they have a very formidable team. And I was thinking that strategy is one of the biggest assets that we, that's going to win an election. So if you have people working, it's as if we're having a topic for side of help, but hasn't been well coordinated. So from the inside part of the party, is there a way we can have a more um, unilateral kind of communication where the party actually lets us know really what needs to be done and how people can form it? We can say, okay, this is the deficiency we want to focus on as a group. We want to take care of this. And another group, we come to take care of this. In that way, we'll be able to solve the whole problem. So I would like you to reiterate on that. And then secondly, is uh, the issue of... Uh, um, you know, coming, you know, making uh, your presence here in America. I, I know some of what, some of the um, our members have volunteered to do that, but you know, we probably with the, you know having a little bit more information so that as a group we can plan on how we can get involved in that and you know get get more participation in that. Thank you. Well, well thank you very much. Um, you know. Uh, <clears throat> I know that when you look at political parties, look at Nigeria, it is natural to ask the kind of question that you've asked about the party, where things are. Yes, the real story is um, the Labour Party was just a shell until a few weeks ago. What do I mean by a shell? I mean, they were one of those parties that exists during election periods people who are upset in some party in the local area. Uh, following, but the owners of the APC and PDP have locked them out. They may just go to a labor, pay some money, the labor type party, pay some money to the chairman and he'll give them a ticket and sometimes they win and they win and they, they get to the National Assembly or wherever it is, then the next month they, they, they move back to PDP and stuff like that. That's what was going on for years. Um, so the party is almost shocked to deal with it. And in some ways, it's not going to help too much fix the party right now. Most of the people who hold positions in the party recognize that literally in transition. And for many of them, this is the moment 
to make A. So um, what the court judgment that led to labor, retrieving the labor party suggests is that there should be a convention to get new people to take over the leadership of the party. Now that they expect to happen, most of them in the party leadership expect that they will lose out when that happens. Um, and they see this moment as they are, to use the words of the President of the Labour Congress in a private meeting we all had, uh, they're looking for their retirement benefits. Prof, are you still there? Okay, I guess we'll wait for him to get back on. But everyone can still hear me, correct? Sure. Yes. So we can hear you. Okay, let me send him a message through the back end. Professor Tommy. Well, so as we wait for him to come, I, I have, I'm just looking at some of the comments here. I see that Nigerians really, really mean business this time. Um, Barrister Kiri Anibe just wrote that if Peter Obi can pay for at least 100 uh, polling watchers or agents per uh, each of the 176,974 local government area, that will give you 17,697,400 people if those people decide to vote for him. I never really thought of that as an option. So, and he's saying if you pay 10,000 to each of those, that's almost, uh, I don't know how much this figure comes to, but that's something interesting to, to think about. So I'm still texting Professor Tommy to see if we can get him back on. Oh, did he drop out? I can't see his name. Yeah, so I think he was using iPhone 13. Yes. I've added him back in. Apologies, okay. internet. Okay, yes. welcome back. I think it's the number after 100. I don't think it takes more than 100. Yeah. So, Prof, go ahead. Um, uh, okay. I'm going to just question. So, I was saying that, um, um, you know, it would be too much trouble to try and rebuild the party right now. We are using disruptive means, not non traditional kinds of approaches to get things done. What has happened to the campaign has not come from the work of the Labour Party. And it's best to just leave things the way they are until after the elections, the Labour Party can be properly reorganized. But as I said, there's so much that technology can help us do. It's helping us already, can help us some more. And that's how we're trying to proceed. I will, will support, patch up, make the basic organs of the party work because we need the party. It is the party that will be called on by INEC and all, all those. But any um, elaborate effort at rebuilding the party right now will meet with challenges uh, uh, from individuals who. I think we lost Prof again. Yes. We've lost him again. Okay, let me send him another. Sorry, note. my I don't know what's happening to my network is getting okay. quite challenged. Um so so anyway, uh, um we do need um to to do little bits of uh, patching up in the party, but 
let's not see the party as the real vehicle that will make us win or do anything we want to do. The party will be fixed immediately after the elections. Okay. Thank you, Professor Tommy. So I don't know if you were here when I was uh, making a comment about one of the questions that uh, Barrister Ibe dropped, where he was suggesting that if Labour Party is willing to pay 10,000 Naira to at least 100 polling unit agents in the whole 176,974 local government areas, which comes to about 177 trillion Naira, that that can give us almost uh, 17 million six nine seven four hundred votes, assuming those polling agents were to vote for the Labour Party. Something to think about. So I'll call Dr. Dosumu uh, to ask her questions. I see her hand is up. Dr. Dosumu, please. Thank you, Dr. Ferdinand. Um, good evening, Thank Prof. Thanks for joining us. We appreciate you. your making time out of your busy schedule to join us today. Um, so for me, you know, as a group, we're making a lot of effort to reach out to people um, at the grassroots. We're telling them to get their PVCs and eventually go out to register. However, I'm concerned with what strategy, because I've not heard any so far, um, what strategy candidates and Labour Party have in place to help us prevent thugs, you know, in Lagos especially, and I mean, maybe some other parts of the North, from hijacking the process. Because like you said earlier, I actually believe that Article 1, the last presidential election too. I, I mean, I, I saw all that happened. Now, I'm worried that we might have a repeat of that process. And, you know, if that happens again, it will just be our efforts you know, at the end of the day being wasted. So I'm, I'm, I'm interested in what the party and candidates are putting in place to ensure this does not happen again, because that's my biggest concern, in all that, you know, we're doing. Thank you. Thank you. Well, there's a significant change since the last election. Now, election results are gonna be transmitted straight from the polling booths to the national headquarters. Traditionally, a lot of the rigging is in the transmission process. Between the polling booths and the state capital, the numbers change. That will not be able to happen in this election. Electronically, it will go up straight from the polling booth. So that's one major difference. This is why the concentration in preventing rigging is at the polling booth. That's why we're talking about these people that will pay some money. And in one of the interviews I gave, I said, we will have up to 15 people in every polling station. Not 15 people that will pay, but 15 people who are loyal, who in different guises, whether they are monitors for the church or for this, for that, for that will be there. And then those who will pay. And those who will monitor the people monitoring. Um, once we ensure that what was counted is immediately uploaded. Uh, will be fine. So the only key thing to ensure that the votes were properly uploaded. So, sir, I I am actually referring to when people want to come out and you have area boys ah, okay, and the guns. Yes, that's my concern. You know, this is Lagos, especially. Yeah. I know. We, I mean, we, I'm, I'm sure you understand what yeah. I mean. Okay, I know what you mean. Lagos, yes, that tends to happen quite a bit. But um, if I tell you what we are planning on that, it will not be. Um, oh, fine. We will not be able I, I just, to do it I'm anymore. Okay but we're working on a strategy. Okay, thank you. That's fine. Oh, we thank have you, a strategy. Sir. Yeah, oh. yeah. All right, thank you. So I'll call Dr. Simpa Dania to ask his questions. Dr. Dania. That's an interesting question here. Dr. Daniel, um, can you unmute yourself? Okay. Good evening, Prof. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. My name is Dr. Simpa Daniel. I basically work with media. 
um, for the group and uh, a bit of IT. Um, I'm just wondering from your perspective, right? If you, if you, how you view um, how healthcare and healthcare workers can be a strategic um, tool for the campaign. What, what is the thinking? Um, I mean, we've got a couple of ideas what to do. I mean, so for instance, we've achieved, we've thought out a five-step process, right? Which is first, people people need to go register, people need to get claim their PVCs. Next, you know, they need to choose the candidate they're going to vote for. Then they're going to have to go vote, and then we need to protect those votes, right? And we have strategies across those five points to try and make sure that we, we increase the funnel and you know the throughput across there, so that ultimately, um, but but from the party perspective, from your perspective, you know, what strategic role, what what what's what's there for healthcare that we can marshal, you know, to to make sure that this becomes a reality. Thank you. Well, first of all, almost like I said about um, the church, healthcare personnel are usually very widespread in their presence in the country. Um, <clears throat> we may not have as many doctors in rural areas, but in a country where we are all getting so sick, everybody's trying to reach some healthcare personnel. Now, if through your network, you can establish a consciousness in which you try anybody who comes before a doctor, a nurse, a pharmacist, is to look, things can be different, you know? If only you vote in this way, you think in this manner, we could have a, be a better deal, all of us. Just small hints in conversations, just like pastors are doing in their churches and all of that. You'll be amazed at the reach and encourage them. Okay, it's not a matter of just getting your PVC, but you need to talk to your neighbor and wake up your neighbor on election day and say, let's go and vote. If that messaging can go out, word of mouth from healthcare personnel across the country, hey, we'll be home, home and dry. So I think that that's, um, I mean, we're gonna have messaging that will address the issue because it's very important. Education and healthcare are very important in uh, our priority uh, base and our messaging will have a strong emphasis on that. But this word of mouth thing from healthcare people around uh, will have enormous impact, I think. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Like, just one last thing, right? One of the things that we also looked at is uh, the wristband. I don't know if you've seen, but, you know, most of the churches have that kind of stuff that they wear around, you know, people wear around their rich. We think that is a persistent reminder uh, of the branding of the, uh, of the party. Uh, so that's people go to the polling board. You, we just want to confirm, is that, is that the same way the party is saying it? Is it something that might be of interest uh, to see widespread across the country? You know, um, Sorry, I missed something. It. I missed something there. Sorry, I didn't hear. Okay, so what's the issue about um, wristband? Wristband. Right. Yes. Okay. And our goal is to try and get about 6 million out. One to each your okay. zone. I've read the about okay. 500 to each um, mm -hmm. local government. Um, so people wear that, and hopefully, as they go to mm -hmm. the vote, they're, they're wearing it down to the you know to when they vote, where they go to you know vote at the polling uh, booth. And it's a visual. So that's a, that's right a brilliant there. one. Yes. Mm. Okay. Yeah. So I just wanted to come. I've been very helpful, that. especially yeah in rural areas, people who need to be reminded where they're supposed to or how they're supposed to vote. Okay. The wristband will be very very. Powerful too. Okay, thank, thank you for confirming that. Thank you very much. All right, thank you, Dr. You're welcome. So, I'll call, I still see a lot of hands up, but I'll call Dr. Abara, Chinidu Abara, if you want to ask your question quickly. Dr. Abara, please. Yeah, uh, thank you very much, Prof. Uh, uh, Tommy, for all you have been doing. Uh, to 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 uh, get to uh, the point, um, is Labour Party making any effort to have INEC restart PVC uh, registration to avoid the enfranchising 
large number of potential uh, Peter OB followership as uh, legally registration is supposed to occur up to three months to time for election. Thank you. We have been shouting. We will continue to shout. But in Nigeria, uh, one of the biggest challenges we have is the attitude of regulators of any industry, much not talk of uh, elections. Uh, the mindset of the regulator in Nigeria is that of a bully. If you give any Nigerian authority uniform, he immediately thinks that, you know, he's point of view should never be questioned, whether it's the Central Bank, Securities and Exchange Commission, the policeman. So it's a cultural challenge we have to deal with. I, 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 you know, two years ago, Faust Magazine wrote a piece that basically explained why we're not getting the kind of investments we should be getting to Nigeria. It was titled Nigeria's, Nigeria, Africa's and, and one of the biggest risks of doing business in Nigeria is regulatory risk. From my own goals is regulatory. Uh, and so we have this battle. We managed to get INEC to shift. And if you push for that, they think like they are losing their authority. So we're pushing it anyway. And we hope we can manage to get them to think differently. She just, in my opinion, she be able to register even one week to elections. In, you know, but the law obviously gives some time for them to be. And still, we have played. That. Is it possible? Is it possible? To, you, uh, the voice uh, of citizens everywhere. Sorry? Is it possible to pursue uh, legal? Uh, uh, process uh, well it's probably better if it's not us directly it's some citizen action i mean that's what my what, what type of action uh, uh, does most of the recommend. time uh, that, you know that can establish local standard and say as a group of citizens we think we're about to be denied our civil right you know those who travel could not do it and even your own process was so um, clumsy that pe people who have work, you know, uh, where you didn't make enough room and time for them. So, so we could continue to push for sure. So, Dr. Barra, I don't know if you are aware the Peter OB support network is actually looking for citizens who wanted to register but were not able to because of this abrupt discontinuation if those citizens or you know anyone who is willing to be joined as part of the class action lawsuit the peter Abbey support network is gathering them together and they plan to kind of help them facilitate filing a class action lawsuit to see if we can change this law so uh, you can text me or if you need any uh, more information regarding that. So I'll call Dr. Ebuchunam. Uh, but Dr. Ebuchunam, before you come on board, uh, Prof. Utomi, that is uh, somebody who sent a message and said, please don't mention my name. But he wants uh, me to bring it to your attention that we hope the Labour Party is insisting that they will get international software security uh, um, uh, companies that will also be part and parcel of this electronic transmission of results so that there is no data compromise or data breaches when they are doing the transmission of the uh, distance. I mean, you don't have to speak to details if you guys are already doing that, but it's something I just wanted me to bring to your attention. So Dr. Ibuchinam, if you can ask your question, please. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Thank you, Prof, for coming uh, to this meeting. Um, I personally have learned a lot today, and I hope there will be more of this kind of meeting. I have two questions, and not to overflow the horse. Um, 
Chip O'Neill in the U.S., the popular Chip O'Neill said, all politics is local. So just to um, emphasize on the fact that we do need boots on the ground and local government headquarters and offices for Labour Party, and we probably, hopefully, will start working on that. Um, my second and main question is uh, about media. I know that no, <laughs> no campaign will survive without an organized uh, media outreach without an organized communication standard. And uh, I, I, I know that here, one of my favorite uh, campaigns was the one run by Clinton in 1993. And I talk about the movie, The War Room. Um, I've seen a lot of things put out about PDOP. And I know that people are trying to brand him. The opposition is trying to brand him. I don't see much of an organized response yet. And I'm hoping there will be. But my question is, is there something in the world? Is there something in the world to, to be able to respond to that kind of thing, to be able to write the wrong media output, uh, output by other parties? Is there something in the world to actually be proactive and offensive, uh, be on the offense uh, as this campaign goes on? I see a lot of videos. I see a lot of people doing things that just seem random. Um, but is, is Labour Party uh, organized in a way to put out some kind of communication or media. And I think those of us in diaspora would really be able to, are in a position to be able to help with that. Thank you. Thank you so very much. <clears throat> yes, there is. Actually, we have a director uh, which operates from a, right out of my center. And that director, has um, uh, led branding and media in one of the biggest banks in the country for many years. Uh, they formally begin work this week, actually, but they do exist, and there's a structure to be able to do. There's a rapid response team to those kinds of things that are put out, and um, uh, the, the machine will become quite well oiled as we go along. So thank you for answering that question, uh, Prof. I remember during one of the town hall meeting with uh, Peter Obi, that was one of the questions I asked, whether he has a media war room, you know, to, to counter all these negative things about him. And from then I, I didn't really get a sense that they have one. Now we'll be reaching back to you because one of the things we would like to appeal is, you know, just like Dr. Buchanan said, politics is local. People feel more connected when they see regular average people actually speaking up. Uh, mm. For some of us who are here in the diaspora and with our group, we are willing to partner with new people to actually put our members out there to speak about why we think this is the way to go or this is the way, rather than just having scripted messages alone from uh members of the brand and if you guys need faces to put in front of those messages we'll be more than willing to give you guys that so a lot that i will still send to you in text messages you know all the things that we've uh, talked uh, about because i'm taking notes so that we can keep track so i'll call dr chete is in liam to ask our questions dr chete yeah please. yeah hi hi you can hear me right yes we can hear you Okay, hi, uh, thanks, uh, Dr. Tommy. I've heard so much about you, read so much about you, very impressive. I'm so happy to be here. I'm Dr. Chichai Zonli, I'm a, um, well, one of the docs in diaspora and uh, one of the coordinators of the group. Um, you know, we've received some um, reports that sometimes some people are locally contesting for local positions, um, you know, local government uh, levels. Sometimes the Labour Party officials there um, do ask for some compensation in exchange for the seats. And even there was an incident at some, some time during one of the outreaches that there was a, a, some issue about uh, some of the officials asking for some compensation. Uh, have you received such reports? Because this particular um, uh, complaint was that the, 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 the person was uh, disenfranchised and the position was taken from him. So if this is kind of like systematic, then it's problematic, right? Because the new, the youth who want to be a part of the movement are deprived of these opportunities. Um, do you, have you heard of lot, such reports and is there a systematic way the party is approaching this? Yes, thank you. Um, we have heard a couple of those, uh, they're random, but um, 
you know, the challenge that we have in our country is that we've experienced a collapse of culture. And so we find that these things have become ingrained in the culture and we have to do everything to manage them. As I said earlier, we're trying not to uh, become overbearing behavior within the party because it's going to be distracting for where we are going. Uh, but um, if you will, um, goodwill, we try to talk to them to behave more sensibly. Um, <clears throat> There's so many lawsuits fl flying all, all over the place. And we just don't want to compound matters. Uh, um, we let them play themselves out. So yes, there are a couple of those. Uh, are we trying to, yes, we use moral suasion. We call up the chairman, we call up the organizing secretaries. But between you and I, what we can do is limited, otherwise we become distracted and the big picture, the big goal can get lost in the process. We can only hope that when uh, we win the election, we really take proper control of the party. We have new people in place. There were people who we uh, have properly um, found and encouraged to seek those positions and have the right values. Uh, so that we can have the kind of shared values that would move things in a different track. Uh, but for now, uh, I think we may, you just have to live with certain things as we use moral suasion to try and get them to do what's right, where those kinds of issues arise. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, Miss um, Achebe, you're next. You have to unmute yourself. Yeah. Can you unmute? Many us? years ago, I have unmuted. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Yeah, we can hear you now. Oh, okay. Yeah. Hi. Good morning from my part of the world, Professor Tommy. Mm -hmm. Good morning. Thank you. I met you many years ago when you helped me launch your book. Thank you very much, and thank you for being here today. Um. I think some, you partially answered my question because somebody else asked the same question. And my question is still about um, uh, uh, supporters being able to register on the INEC. My understanding is that uh, the INEC is supposed to register people three months to the election. I'm a little bit alarmed that we don't have a very good strategy for holding INEC accountable. I know that you have said that, um, you know, INEC is, uh, you know, there are people there that are sensitive about having pressure applied on them and all that sort of thing. But I think this is too serious for us to embrace uh, those kinds of, of uh, sensitivities of feelings. I think we really need to be very aggressive about getting a legal strategy in place about putting pressure on INEC to continue registering our people. Because we all know that the new people that are registering are mainly LP supporters. And INEC, I believe, has no interest in registering these people. And the other parties have no interest in these people being registered. So I think um, this is, uh, because if people don't register, they can't vote. And if people can't vote, uh, Peter Obi cannot win. So I think this is really, really important. And I think that, you know, if we can help in any way to get the legal strategies, if we have to have many teams uh, suing in many courts of law, I think we should do that. Thank you very much. All right, thank you. Uh, Prof, you wanna answer that? Right. All right. Um, like I say, you know, we're going to keep making the effort. We're going to keep struggling. Uh, but, um, you know, um, 
sometimes pressure from outside does a lot more. And if diaspora groups are raising this issue, getting it on even international media, the effect will be much more, I think, than um, working very hard to put pressure, but we can't be sure how they will respond. All right, thank you, Prof. Thank so you. Professor Ekaise, if you want to ask your, your questions quickly. I'm Professor, sorry, who did you call? Professor Ekaise. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Yeah, uh, good evening, our Ibu chairman. I want to personally appreciate uh, our dear brother Ferdinand. Uh, very simple and straight to the point. I want to appreciate everyone of us. But my question is, we have a very serious problem at hand. And the only way we can achieve this is through this platform of Labour Party. But is the Labour Party ready? Because I've said a number of notes since this uh, message started. Are we ready to take this leadership from the people that have destroyed this country, which attack take back our country. Because the Labour Party, sir, is not fully grounded in the unit, world, local government, and state. Maybe a little bit of percentage uh, presence in the federal. The only way we can achieve this thing, sir, because of the previous uh, fallout in the previous election, which our dear professor party told me I've mentioned, because people come to the Labour Party and they, they are bought over. Right now, the only message in Nigeria, among the Nigerian youth, is obey for president. Obedient. Everybody is becoming obedient because of the de decay in the society. I want the Labour Party, sir, to form a coalition with all the various movements for obey becoming president. Because this movement have gone seriously to the grassroots. With this coalition, we were able to form a strong force to take back our Nigeria from the people that are taking back or backward. Because the Labour Party, sir, they are not ready. They are not ready. This coalition is very, very important. They shouldn't play politics with it. Very, very serious. Right now, we should start moving, forming all the coalition from the state to the federal local government. Let us form that serious coalition. With that, we uh, secondly, we need a strategy, which we're discussing how do we win the election. Money is there. Yes, what are the strategies? Somebody have mentioned. All the write up people have been writing about about uh, We should have an AG room that will be coming out with a counter report of what they are writing against our candidate. That is my my, my, my mission. Thank you very much. Thank you, Prophet Swami. Prof, you need to unmute yourself. Any quick response to this? Comment. Well, thank you. Thank you. We, we, we are doing our utmost. We are improving the grid. <clears throat> right. I'm saying that we, we are uh, doing our very best to build those coalitions. We have what we call a big tent. In fact, the big tent of the third force. And it's supposed to bring together social, move, political parties that want a new Nigeria. In fact, we're on this call, one of the directors of the group from Atlanta, um, in this directorate, and uh, they have the, uh, the duty to coordinate all the um, Peter will be support groups. There's a situation room there that people who are equipped in that room and provide information to all the support groups. We are from next week on, and every morning,
Okay, Prof, seems your internet is down again. Professor Tommy. Okay, I'm back. Okay. So this is really the, yeah. So this is the effort that we are making with this directorate, linking all the support groups, linking to the spokespersons in every state of the Federation. We talk in points on the daily basis going out to everybody, and we can have a coordinated messaging uh, system. If I can uh, manage our extract uh, before I leave the number for one or two of the people in the directorate and they can be reached. Okay. So that would be very helpful, Prof. We'll reach out to you so that we can get those numbers and start uh, reaching out to them to see how we can help. Okay, A.G. Kionu, do you have your questions ready, if you can ask now? But we'll make it very quick, just 30 okay. seconds, please, because we are really running out of time. Quick. Good evening, everybody. Good evening, Prof. Thank you for coming to speak with us. We have learned a lot from you. Um, my, I uh, just want to quickly answer one of the uh, questions you raised uh, during your general comments about one of the problems uh, that we have in the health sector. Um, one of the major problems we have in the health sector of Nigeria, it's um, about uh, divide and rule. Um, the fact that uh, the people at the top have so smartly uh, divided us such a way that we now see our individual selves as the problem in the health sector, instead of them, the leaders, who are supposed to put, put on policies and put on effective political will to help the uh, health sector stand on its own. The nurses now see doctors as the problem. Pharmacists see the doctor as the problem, instead of us to work uh, collectively against the government. They have so smartly used this divide and rule strategy that is now affected us. Um, that's what I want to talk about. Uh, the next thing also is that is the fact that um, I want to really emphasize the need that uh, I don't know, but we really need to get eye neck by hook or by uh, crook. Any means we have to use to get eye neck to extend this deadline, because um, at the end of the day, it it's likely to affect us more than the other parties. So because um, around here in Ogun State, I get a lot of fillers, a lot of people who wanted to register, but due to one or two uh, inefficiencies for my neck and so many other things that have been happening around there, uh, they couldn't register. And they are not the problem. I know that some people are trying to put some strategies to to get INEC to, but it seems that strategy is taking too long. But the truth is that a lot of people are yet to register. Thank you. Okay. So thank you, Dr. Onu. But I, I'm pretty sure the Professor Tommy has, you know, talked a lot about a lot of the things we, you were talking about regarding- Led to that, yes. Uh, to get uh, people involved and the healthcare, sector divide and rule, you know, he's talked about it also that we need to, um, um, the Labour Party and the Peter Obi campaign will like us as stakeholders now to actually speak to them how we think changes can come. We have to come from bottom up, not from top down, like we used to do. So Dr. Idu Nwapa, I will call you to ask your question quickly, but let's keep it very brief um, because we'll be rounding up very soon. Dr. Nwapa. Okay, well, it's really hard to ask a question after 30 questions, but uh, my question has kind of evolved um, as I'm listening to everybody. Prof, thank you for coming every time. You have the ability to um, FCO for some work. I'll just stand on a previous protocol. I think what I'm really hearing out of everybody is that we want to avail ourselves of the superstructure. Prof, thank you for explaining the dissonance between the Labour Party 
and the Pita Ubi movement, because that was a big concern of mine. Now, understanding that we can't, yes, understanding that we can't really try to fix that now. Can we try to understand the superstructure, the ox structure of the Pita Ubi larger movement so that we can understand how to plug in and play. It's not everything that we post on Peter will be good that all of us can do. But if we actually see what you are doing from a panoramic view that is not classified information, then we all have skill sets and um, things that we can provide to key into that. I personally would like to uh, volunteer for that uh, war room that you're talking about, the academy the, that's running out of your center. Um, I have interest in data, I have abilities there, but it's not necessarily stuff I can channel through docs for Peter Obi. That's not all we are. Doctors, probably our career, our day job, but we have multifaceted, versatile people that have a lot more to offer than just what we can do under the umbrella of Peter Obi. But we cannot help if we don't know where help is needed. So that's where my trouble with strategy is. And I really feel that we have the bullet pulpit. We should not be defending. We should be on the offensive, like somebody said earlier. Those are my two comments. I have many more, but a lot of them have been covered. Okay. And uh, yeah, I'll just stop All here. Right. Thank you. All right, Prof, any comments? Uh, I know you we've answered a lot of them, but just one of them. Uh, well I think what I'd like to do is uh, say that I'd, I'd like to, uh, to, to stay uh, connected to people who might have specific contributions they'd like. Uh, okay. We are in the States, directly with those two in the places who will visit and um, get more direct uh, um, uh, inputs. Uh, but I am reachable. My number can be made available to anybody who and uh, I think it will be. All right. Thank you, Prof. So just like I said, I will do a brief summary of everything and the actionable items which we've talked about, send it to you so that we can start working on them and start uh, reaching out to the rest of the group. So Beverly, Issa, I will call you and I will take one more question uh, or comment after that so that we can round up. I know it's been a long uh, day. Beverly, are you there? Beverly, Issa? Yes, I am, sir. Good afternoon, everybody. And a big thank you to Professor Utomi and all the organizers for this group. I will keep it very short. I am located in Los Angeles, California. So I'm very interested on in the August 29th meeting, but my question is, on behalf of diaspora youth, which I represent in young professionals, how do we get involved in the upcoming visits? And secondly, what is the social media strategy? Because I notice it's very WhatsApp based, but it really needs to move beyond WhatsApp. So I would just like to know what is the actual social media strategy to bring together the diaspora with those in Nigeria? Thank okay. you very much. Thank you. So, Prof, do you want to take a stab at that? Prof? Has it been selected? Okay. I guess that's a network issue right there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Is there, but his mic is uh, muted. No, there are two, okay. two iPhones. Are they on my Yes. Oh, okay. 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 Welcome back. Yeah, we can hear you, Prof. Go ahead. You have the floor.
I'm going to say a quick uh, bye bye. I, I, the question about the media strategy, I wish I, I, I would like to get back to uh, the question. Uh, we can engage her and give her more information. Uh, best I know is um, the, the Los Angeles event on the 29th. Uh, it's being coordinated by Senator Andy Yokonkwo, who lives in the area. Um, but I can get some more details through, uh, you know, this platform. All right, thank you. Okay. Bro. I know it's been a very so, long drawn out thing and um, I want to thank you for attending. And like I said- All right, thank you all. I yeah. really appreciate uh, thank you, the uh, thank time you, that I have spent with you. And I thank look you, forward to um, another thank one in the future. All right. Thank you, Prof. Thank you, Prof. Thank you, Prof. All thank right. You. Thank you. Bye-bye. Yeah. OK. Does anybody have the information for the definite information of the locations and where to go? I want to attend the DC one. Um, we'll get all that across uh, later once we get it. But Dr. Dusumu, you have a quick announcement to make before. Yeah, um, so we are aware that there are a lot of people that are trying to get their PVCs. Um, they registered prior to this recent uh, registration, that's about two, three, four years ago. And they've been finding it difficult to pick up at the INEC offices. Either the officials tell them it's not available or it's not ready or whatever excuse, just to make sure they don't pick it up. So if you or your relatives have such issue. Um, please get in touch with Dr. Simpa because we now have a way to help people collect those PVCs. So get in touch with Dr. Simpa. He's going to tell you um, how to send your sleep across to those um, local governments where you can pick up. They'll check if it's ready and if it's ready, we'll try to get it out for you. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. And thank you everyone for coming. Just like I said, um, I would summarize and then send all the questions we've asked uh, to Professor Otomi to see if they can pass that to Peter Obi campaign and the Labour Party so they can get back to us with actionable items which we can keep into. Thank you everyone for attending despite your busy schedule. It's been a very enlightening uh, evening and uh, afternoon. And I wish everybody all the best. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ferdinand. We'll see you soon again. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ferdinand.